This week, Formula E street racers is on the road again. To a country famed for its style and chic. To a region full of flavour. To a city steeped in history. And most importantly, to one of the most impressive trade shows in Europe. Hello from Bologna in the Emilia Romagna part of northern Italy. We're here to check out the latest electric cars on display here at the City's Motor Show. And of course, we'll be sharing with you the best this showcase event has to offer. We'll also be bringing you lots more from the world of Formula E. Yet you'd really struggle to park that one, wouldn't you? Coming up, a man on a mission to a Faraday future. Primed in the paddock with DS Virgin and going through the gears to make history in Greenland. Here at the Bologna Motor Show, there are hundreds of cars on display, including some of the newest EVs. And that's the hot topic of this year's event, transferring the science of an FE car from the track to the road. Motorsport gives us the chance to test new uh, technology, new idea, and the final target is to move what we are racing today into the road car. We start to race this year with Mahindra, and uh, we are proud of the two podiums they achieved in Hong Kong and in Marrakech. Today we have, uh, during a race, that is more or less one hour, we exchange two cars. The new rules will force us to have only one car, so that means that we have to find more efficiency on the car, not only on the batteries, but also on the aerodynamic, to find more efficiency on the weight of the car. And these are all the things that we will use later on on the normal life, on the normal car that we will drive all together. This is the telemetry system. With this box, we are able to exchange information related to the performance of the car and uh, as soon as we are able to trace perfectly what's going on in the car, we have a lot of chance to improve the safety of the car. So Mauricio, yes. to, to add a bit of fun to the day, you yeah. have this telemetry game, but yes. talk me through it because it's a partnership, isn't it? So, there are two places where, where, the, people, where the people can play and uh, one player is giving suggestion and the other one is driving. So, to make the, the time on the lap, you, you need to get the suggestion to drive properly. It seems... Keep driving. Yeah. Oil, oil, watch out for the oil. Oil, okay. I'm like an older retired man for the moment, not a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's your ignition coil, your oil's low, it's all going wrong. Abort mission, abort, peak abort mission. So the experience that we are doing in order to trace this fast moving object yes. uh, will be done in the future in our city in order to trace uh, uh, the car, to trace the traffic, to manage uh, the pedestrian, a lot of things. So we made it. We made a good yes, team, yes, didn't we? Yes. It's been a pleasure driving with you. Yes. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. From the track to the road to the paddocks and a recent recruit in the Faraday Future Dragon Racing team, carving out a brand new career thanks to a winning formula. I've always wanted to do something out of the ordinary, which is why I joined the military in the first place. I was a Royal Engineer for six years. I joined at 17 and I thought that, that was solely me and that I would never be able to do anything else. I always wanted to progress to, to better myself and, and better my career opportunities and aspects. So I went for quite an arduous course on the side of the Special Forces world, but I was prevented because of injury. As I was training back for it, I ended up having a couple of heart attacks. One major one and two prior to that that weren't diagnosed. It was real shock because I'd never felt a pain like it, and I'd been through some pain. Luckily, I was 200 metres away from the hospital, otherwise I'd be dead. I actually sat in front of the cardiologist. He asked me, so what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm just going to train and jump straight back on that course. And he said, no, that's never going to happen. You're done. It was the end of my career. I was diagnosed with PTSD just before I left the army. That was on the basis that I kept on thinking that I was going to have another one and it's still to this day, it's the same. I was admin discharged on the medical grounds. 
It was devastating. A lot of guys joined the army to do their four years and that's it. For me, it was my life. My dad was in, my granddad was in, my twin brother was in. I had no intention of leaving. I didn't really know what to do. I was too proud to go back and, and sponge off my mum. I was sleeping in my car. I'd lost my girlfriend, my job, my lifestyle. I was at the lowest of the low. My mum pushed me into a charity to get help and get my identity back. And that charity was the Warrior Programme. It got me an opportunity with Mission Motorsport, which is here at Faraday Future Dragon Racing. To have found a home within Mission Motorsport, it was a turning point in my life that I'll never forget. I mean, how many people in the world can turn around and say that they're in a starting grid in Hong Kong? It's pretty special. I really, really enjoy it here. The guys are all really great blokes and they understand what it's like to be a part of a team. It was what I enjoyed and what I didn't want to leave. So to be back in a similar outfit, it's back where I belong. They've just given me that, that little lifesaver that I needed. The only way is up for me now. Now, one challenge Alex hasn't yet had to deal with is having to rebuild a new car on race day. Earlier in the series, we saw Andretti pull it off in Hong Kong and for race two in Marrakesh, it was the turn of DS Virgin Racing. In the final practice session at Marrakesh, Sam Bird runs into a bit of trouble at turn eight. Huge damage on the right hand side, huge damage right hand side. It may not look like much, but this is a big problem if Sam wants his second car to be ready for the race. So we are, uh, we have just finished uh, FP2. Um, sadly, uh, Sam has put a wheel in the dirty part of the track, so he may lose the car and, uh, and he's done quite a fair bit of damage to the car. A quick assessment reveals the whole front end has to be replaced. The engineers spring to action. It shows how tricky this circuit is. It's really, really dirty. Uh, and when they are practicing for faster slap to uh, prepare for qualifying, it's really, really easy to do a mistake. The team now has just three hours for a full suspension rebuild. After an incredible effort by the whole garage, it's ready just in time. Bird, the car repaired after a crash in practice. The same car in pieces hours earlier is steered to a second place finish. The team did an amazing job really kind of fixing that, that second car because I, I really put it in the wall quite hard. So this is for the boys. Thank you very much indeed, boys. While there's a timeout to get everything fine-tuned before the next E-Pre in Buenos Aires, I'm not taking any chances. I'm making sure I get plenty of practice in, you know, just in case they ever need a backup driver. But what happens to the cars between the races? Well, to find out, we took a trip to Spain. Come on. Yes, Street Racers has touched down in the Catalan capital to visit the famous Circuit de Barcelona, where just around the corner is the European testing garage for India's Mahindra racing team. And after he sorted himself out, their chief engineer is ready to bring us up to speed. Better or worse? Where's the bathroom? Oh, that'll do. My role involves uh, coordinating all of our engineering staff, mainly trackside, but also in between races. We don't really come here that often, but when we get the opportunity to work on the cars, we take it. Street racing means that there's a lot of knocks and extra care that is needed um, with the cars, and it always helps to do it in our own workshop with some time and some calmness rather than at the track. And the engineers now get some time to maybe try out a few things on the software side or the hardware side, static test in the workshop. Luis is their number one mechanic. We're doing the setup for Buenos Aires. So it's not exactly the same as Marrakesh, because Marrakesh was a half normal circuit, and Buenos Aires is full street circuit. So we need to raise the car up just for the curves, and it's more bumpy than Marrakesh. Before the long journey to South America, some final preparations are made to the cars. We'll take all of these cars down to this level. So the one that's on the patch has already been taken down to this level and it's already ready to go. All of the bays here are equipped with all the tools that we need. We also bring out some of our smaller toolboxes. This is, this is the level of equipment that we'll take to every race. But as you can see around you, the, the workshop's much bigger. So at the races, we try and minimize the amount of equipment that we need. But when we're at the workshop, we've got a lot more tools that we can use. 
This car is almost ready to go and we are just putting the final touches together. We're working on the brake system. This will need to be set up and put over there on the patch. And once all that's done, we're pretty much ready to go racing again. It might be a bit chilly in Bologna, but nothing like the Arctic conditions Formula E encountered when it attempted to take a racing car to the Arctic to highlight the problem of climate change. Last week we left the team in Greenland staring at failure when they discovered their chosen surface had melted and broken into three. That meant there was just one more iceberg to try, but local expert Nico is not happy. This is Jeremy Diz, I don't like it uh, so much. Three main pressure lines right okay. here. Okay, let's go back to Kulasuk, please. Need to make some decisions. The iceberg dream is dead. They've no chance of getting a car safely onto the iceberg now. A lot of effort has gone into this project and tensions are strained. Iceberg broke yesterday. I was aware of that full hand, but yes, I'm now aware of that. So we have yeah, I a plan understand, I understand we and we can I don't have a adapt to that. We have two hours whilst he's flying yeah, to see what we can do. The issue is that the guys that were working on the iceberg yesterday, some of them are not happy to, to go back and work on, on another iceberg because they think it's a challenge uh, and, uh, and, there's a, and, and there's a risk. So that's their, own, uh, that's their own decision. But we've come all this far, the car's here, you know, we've got the infrastructure. Uh, to walk away now would be, you know, would, would be a, a real shame. Formula E CEO Alejandro Agag will arrive shortly, expecting to see his car in action. A last gasp solution is proposed. It might be possible to drive the car on the Greenland ice cap itself. Ice, but on solid ground. Nico and Tim, pilot, uh, glaciologist, they both think it's, uh, it's feasible, but we want to go up there and see for ourselves and whether the car can actually run you know, on the second biggest ice cap in the world. It's flat enough. We don't need to do anything to this. What do you reckon? Hey, Carlos is happy, I'm Alejandro and driver Lucas de Grassi make it to Tulasuk. There has been a change of plan, and they're going with it. For me, the most important is really to drive the car on the ice cap. So we take the car to the ice cap. What I really want to show is the effect of global warming on the ice cap and the acceleration of melting. It's the big day. Alejandro, Lucas and the team arrive on the ice cap. Now it's just left for the car to be transported the 60 kilometer journey across the coastline to Isotuk. Finally, after months of planning and countless setbacks, everything comes down to this. It's just an amazing experience. I never thought on my wildest dreams that I could be able to drive a race car on the ice cap. If people see a car racing on the ice cap, and when they see, they remember the problem of climate change, of global warming, that will be a great result. This week's Street Racers has come to the Bologna Motor Show in Italy, the home of some of the world's most famous car manufacturers, from Ferrari to Maserati and, of course, Lamborghini. But what about a brand that you may not have heard of that's paving the way in the electric revolution? like a new brand, but you've been around for years. Yeah, since uh, 1963, so 53 years of history, we are very well known for aluminum foundry. So we are supplier and designer for frame parts, you know, for Ducati, MV Agusta, Audi, Ferrari, Lamborghini, many, many brands. This is not our main business, but we do care and we develop technology since 2006 for electric vehicles. We are the only Italian brand that manufactures and design electric cars. The Zari mission is to present and inspire young people to go green. So your cars, they're a bit unusual. Tell me a bit about this one here. It's called Tatsari Zero EM2 Space. 
and you can personalize it for the uh, exterior. We have more than 8,000 free color combinations. And you have what we call these quadricycles, which are more of a, a sort of a moped design? It's like having a motorcycle, but with four wheels. Uh, Zero Union actually goes up to 45 kilometers per hour, and it has a maximum range of 125 kilometers. But this is for the slightly older driver? Yes, yeah. from 16 year old. In Italy, you can actually go inside the center of the city with this type of car. And it goes a bit faster, this one? Yes, this goes up to 90 kilometers per hour. Now, I love this little car here, the Microlino. What can you tell me about it? Okay, this is a new project. We are a partner with this Swiss company, which is called Micro. The design of this car is inspired by an old uh, uh, Italian model. Yes. And but, but our project will be full electric. And tell me about Tazari's aim for the future. So at the moment, we are designing the race car. The name will be uh, Super Zero Imola, and uh, we are going to test it on the Encendino Ferrari racetrack. So who knows, we could be seeing you as a team in Formula E soon. Yeah, why not, why not? Well, there we have it, Tazari, remember the name. Now, from Tazari to getting a driver in a tiz, time to put Renault Edam's Nico Prost on the spot. Nico. Age? 35. Team? Uh, Renault Dance. Favourite animal? Not a big animal fan. I don't want any animals at home. Lion, maybe. <laughs> Childhood ambition? To be a professional sportsman. I don't know, any sport. And what's your adult ambition? Uh, to win Formula E. <laughs> your sporting hero? Uh, sporting hero, probably Alberto Tomba, the skier. Toughest opponent? Huh. Uh, Seb. <laughs> Favourite country? Uh, home, Switzerland. Worst habit? My worst habit? Um, I don't think I have a really bad habit. <laughs> Teammate's worst habit? Yeah, he's banging on the table when he's not happy. <laughs> Your favourite movie? Top Gun. Best moment in Formula E? Um, probably the first win in Miami. Favourite singer or group? Uh, Nirvana. Greatest moment in life? Uh, probably the birth of my child. Broken any bones? A lot. Leg twice, knee, I can't even count so many uh, like ribs, wrist, arm, shoulder, face, <laughs> so, a lot. A lot. <laughs> Let's just hope Nico can stay injury free until the next race venue in Buenos Aires, which two years ago was the FE career highlight for last week's quickfire contestant, Andretti's Antonio Felix da Costa, then driving for Amli Naguri. And we go green in Buenos Aires. It's a lot of wheel spin for Bueni, but he manages to keep it all together. Good start as well from Heisfeld on the run down towards the first corner. He might get past Al Gashwari. It's a hairpin left-hander that they're coming up to. Heisfeld looks to the outside line, gets a little bit of a tap, but gets up into second place. And here comes the Grassi up the inside, forces his way through at the hairpin at turn five, and he moves up into third position. Lucas de Grassi up the inside of Heidfeld, forces his way through and up in the second move. position. Great opportunistic move again, the same move as he did before. Oh, Buemi, is he going to hit the wall? Oh, he's he's broken, broken his front car. right oh. and he is out oh, of the race. No. Oh. Lucas de Grassi leads, you can hear the, de the despair in Sebastian Buemi's voice. Catches the inside wall and then it breaks as he then oh. goes off there. Yeah, he's broken it when he hit the wall. Yeah. He's done that before. Here they come across the line, He's and surely Bird will look to the inside. De Costa yes. doesn't decide to defend. Big lockup from Lucas de Grassi. Got him. What a move! Lovely. Oh, de Grassi's off as well. Lucas oh. de Grassi, race leader out of the race as well. That means Nick Heidfeld moves into first place. Then there is a very frustrated Lucas de Grassi. Nick Heidfeld leads the race with eight laps to go. And he's going for it again, there's contact. Al Gashwari nudged wide. That was a classic touring car move. It is almost closing in the last minute. Big lock up from Afton, he hits Al Gashwari, and that allows Prost through. What a shame for Al Gashwari, the second time he's been assaulted at turn seven. 
Nick Heidfeld, oh. the race leader, has been given a drive through penalty now for speeding in the pit lane. Victory for Antonio Felix yep. da Costa. The checker flag falls, and it's a win for Amlin Aguri. Yeah! Nice one, boy. Yeah. Da Costa wins in Argentina. And FE returns to that same circuit for the next race of the EV calendar. But before that... January sees the Viva Vegas E-Race, the climax to a major event which has seen fans from around the world compete for the chance to take on the real FE drivers. The online series had gamers tackle four virtual FE circuits with the top ten qualifying for the finale in the entertainment capital of the world. At stake, a share of $1 million, the biggest prize pool in eSports racing history. All 20 FE drivers will test their skills against the qualifiers on a specially designed track, incorporating the famous Las Vegas Strip. This weekend, those 10 finalists were decided after the last race on the London circuit. The qualifiers come from six different countries and each will be allocated an FE team to represent out in Vegas. Top of the qualifying podium is a UK gaming specialist who's had an early chance to check out the competition. So we're here in Marrakesh, I'm about to get my first ever shot on a Formula E car. So I'm Graham Carroll, 26 year old from Edinburgh in Scotland uh, and I'm a competitor in the, the Visa Vegas E-Race. It's the first of its kind, it's a million dollars up for grabs, um, there's been nothing like it in the, in the past so I'm treating it like a job in a way. It's just all about competition and wanting to finish first, you know, just like real life racing. Basically, uh, my career, my race, my real racing career kind of ended in 2008. Uh, won five championships in one year, the British Championship in Formula Ford, and you know, you thought you were going places then, but the credit crunch happened and we just couldn't find 150 grand to go racing. So I kind of packed it in in 2008, sat about and well, went and got a real job, to be fair, became a joiner and stuff, and um, for the last couple of years I've been involved in the sim racing. I just needed that sort of rush in a way that you get from real racing and sim racing is the closest thing to it. You're using the same parts of your brain when you're, when you're on the sim as you are in the, in the real life. So. Aye, so I got to meet Nelson Piquet Jr. and Jerome D'Ambrosio. So again, just giving me wee tips, tips on the track, tips what to expect from the, ah, the braking and the, the downforce and all that kind of stuff. So it's um, it'll really make the difference, I think. I've been driving this car for the past two months online. To come here and drive it in real life, it's pretty. Unbelievable to be fair. Even to have a steering wheel with the dash and all the paddles and the buttons to change, you know, compared to what I'm used to, it's a, a big step up. So. It's a dream come true, you know, from, from the last two months sitting behind PC screens to actually being here and actually driving. It's the same livery and everything on the car, you know, that I drive. So. Got a couple of laps out there and yeah, just different class, you know, it was very strange not hearing a, an engine in the back. It's just um, taking it out in real life and after being sitting on the simulator for, for two months, it's, this is a prize in its own, you know, it really is, you know. Just time before we go to share some of our FE guys celebrating award season before they head off for a Christmas break. Among them, DS Virgin Racing's Jose Maria Lopez, getting emotional as he picks up his third World Touring Car Championship. App Schaeffler Audi Sports' Lucas Degrassi reflects on a year of podium finishes, including seven in FE. And of course, Sebastian Buemi and team boss Jean-Paul Drio collecting this year's FE Champions Prize for Renault Edams. And remember, if you have any thoughts or questions, you can get in touch at FIA Formula E. Sadly, that's all we've got time for here in Bologna. We're off on a mini break, but then we're heading stateside to find out who will be the victor in Vegas. We'll see you in January.